Welcome all. So we are in the process of learning about the estimation of the cash flows for the uh, new investment proposals or for the new projects. And uh, uh, in the previous class, uh, we uh, initiated the discussion on this particular topic that is a cash flow estimation. And we discussed some basics or the fundamentals uh, parts of the fundamental requirements of this uh, cash flow estimation. And we discussed some basic principles of uh, cash flow uh, estimation process. Uh, as we uh, have seen in the previous class also that there are the four important principles of the cash flow estimation which are very important. First one is the separation principle, second one is the incremental principle, third one is the post tax principle and fourth one is the consistency principle. Right. So separation principle I have discussed with you at length where I have talked to you that uh, we have to treat it in uh, two uh, say uh, different ways the inflows and the outflows of the cash and like balance sheet mean the balance sheet also we have the one side which talks about the sources of the funds and on the other side we talk about the applications of the funds or in the simpler language we call it as the say uh, liability and the capital side of the balance sheet and the asset side of the balance sheet. So on the one side the funds flow in the business and uh, on the other side or from the other side it goes out. So we misconvert that cash or that investment into the assets. So we have to separate it right. On the one side we have to show it as the inflow on the other side we have to show it as outflow and finally on the termination of the project what is the terminal cash flow available is we have to calculate that. So that was the separation principle I have discussed at length there. Now I will take you to the next uh, two three other principles because they are very important. Cash flow estimation is not an easy task it takes time to understand and to be clear about the basic fundamentals and for that reason we have to means uh, uh, say bear in mind that all these these things are equally important all these principles are equally important to understand before we move into the into the process of estimating the cash flows practically or physically. So after separation principle the next important principle is the incremental uh, principle is the incremental principle. So when you talk about the incremental principle what we talk about here in this principle is means we have to be very uh, careful while estimating the cash flows and incremental principle plays a very important role. So what this principle says under incremental principle uh, we have to ascertain a project's incremental cash flows that means in which we have to or uh, the incremental cash flows you have to look at what happens to the cash flows of the firm with the project and without the project right. So it means again let us again understand it to ascertain a project's incremental cash flows you have to look at what happens to the cash flows of the firm with the project and without the project right. So when we take up a project what will be the say addition or say deletion maybe reduction in the cash flows or if we do not take the project if we carry on the process without this project how the cash flows of the firm will be there. So incremental will be means normally we expect that there is no reduction in the cash flows otherwise why to take up a new investment proposal. So we expect that there will be increase in the cash flows but that increase is considered as a incremental increase or the incremental cash flows because existing amount we are earning some amount of the cash flows for example the firm is having say four different products they are manufacturing and the total cash flows after say means adjusting for all kind of the cash outflows and everything finally the free cash flow available to the shareholders is uh, somewhere like say 100 crores right. So uh, if we take up a new uh, project new investment proposal and we go for adding up the one or new two new 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 products in the existing product line. So whether our cash flows are going to increase or our cash flows are going to remain stable or some any other kind of changes there normally we expect there is going to be a increase. So that increase will be considered as for example the cash flows become now from 100 to 120 crores so that 20 crores will be the incremental cash flow. So we have to means look at that, that if we take up the project what will happen and if we do not uh, say take up the project what we will what will happen. So you can simply means uh, uh, show it like this that the say uh, cash flows uh, of the project incremental cash flow of the project you can calculate is like this that is the project cash flow project cash flow or the firm cash flow you can call it as the project cash flow for the ART the project cash flow for the year uh, the project cash flow for uh, the year for the year 
say we call it as year T. So, you will calculate it cash flow uh, for the firm, cash flow for the firm with the project, with the project uh, for the year T, for the year T minus, right, minus cash flow for the firm, cash flow for the firm without the project, without the project for the year, for the year T, right. So, it means cash flow for the firm with the project for the year, one particular year T and cash flow for the firm without the project for the year, one particular year which is called as year T for in any particular project and that difference will be count, will be called as the project cash flow for the means year T or for that particular given year. So, it means we are adding up this new project or this new investment proposal and we are going to find out that with the project how much is going to be the incremental means the total cash flow that is the existing cash flow plus the cash flow coming from the new project and if we do not take it up that is a minus cash flow for the firm without the project for the year T for the same year. If you take up the project how much cash flow will be there, if you do not take up the project how much cash flow will be there. So, that difference will be called as the cash flow for the new project for the given period or that particular year which we call as T. So, we have to means look at that always not in the totality we have to look at the cash flow, we have to look at the cash flow in the on the incremental basis and for calculating that incremental cash flow we have to try to find out that whether the cash flow is going to increase as compared to the cash flow without the project or cash flow is going to remain the stable or maybe there is going to be any negative impact upon the existing cash flows that is a very very important thing to be uh, say taken into consideration on born in mind. While following this principle of incremental cash flow we have to follow certain important guidelines and these important guidelines are here 4 or 5 guidelines are here and first guideline is consider all incidental effects. Now, in this case is a very important part because when we take up the project we have to see what is going to be the incidental effect. It may be possible that the new product we are going to add up is, is going to create the problem for the existing products of the firm. Right, or it may be possible that we are going to adapt the new product, increase the sales of the new product, uh, but because of that, the existing resources of the firms which are being used for the existing four products, they have they start feeling the pressure because of the introduction of the new product, fifth product, and it may impact the performance of the existing four products negatively. The sales or the performance of the existing four products may come down. So, we have to be very careful in that part. Right. And what is going to be the incidental effect in terms of sales of the existing products because of the sales of or adding up of the new product. Second thing is what is going to be the incidental effect upon the expenses especially the overheads because when you talk about the direct expenses all direct expenses are directly related to all the different products right talk about the material cost, talk about the labor cost, talk about the direct overheads cost that is directly attributable because if you manufacture one category of the product say product uh, say uh, number 3 or product number 4 or maybe this new product number 5. You will incur only raw material if you go for the manufacturing. If you do not go for the manufacturing of any of the products you will not incur any raw material cost right. Same is the case with the direct labor, same is the case with the direct overheads. Those expenses which are directly identifiable with the introduction or manufacturing of any product or not manufacturing of any product, they are called as the direct expenses. But those expenses which are indirectly affected means there is a common pool of expenses and say means you cannot directly identify that how many expenses are happening or taking place because of manufacturing of the product X, Y, Z, A, B or C. So, that creates the problem right. So, in this case in the overheads also especially in case of the indirect overheads for example, if the indirect overheads are not going to increase like administrative cost like your say your advertising cost like your say selling and distribution cost 
like you, your say other uh, you can general expenses if they are not going to increase by the introduction of the new product so it means we are we can ignore the say, in, uh, say incidental cost also that okay we are introducing the new product directly they are going to be direct expenses which will be included into the cost sheet of the new product but as far as the indirect overheads are concerned they are more or less going to remain same within the given existing administrative cost establishment cost general expenses selling and even distribution expenses we are not going to incur something extra for this so you can think about but if some extra expenses are going to be say uh, say say uh, incurred for the introduction or for the say inclusion of the fifth product then we have to take those in, into consideration how those say extra indirect expenses are going to impact upon the cash flow we have to very very miss, uh, be, be careful about that one more if, uh, important effect here is that is the say uh, product cannibalization effect product cannibalization effect is also there product cannibalization effect is that you can simply define it as erosion of the sales of the existing products because of the introduction of the new products because it may be possible that our attention is diverted from the existing four or divided now among us the five so if our resources are same but if we are adding a one or two new products into the existing say line of the products it may happen that we are not able to take care of your our distribution channels of the existing four products as we were taking care of them in the past so we may lose some of the sales or sometime what happens we are going to introduce a new product which is somewhat similar or a substitute to the existing products so it may be possible though you are coming up with a new product in the market but it can serve the need of the either of the existing products also so the sales of the existing products may be say getting affected negatively so the cannibalization effect have to be taken very seriously whether the sales of the existing products are going to be affected negatively or not if they are going to be affected negatively then we have to means go for one important thing is that try to find it out quantify it that how much sales are going to be there for the from the for the new product and how much sales we are going to lose for the existing products and is there is something kind of that loss of the sales of the existing products because of the introduction of the new product if that is happening then you have to factor those losses of the sales or the loss of the revenue or the loss of the ca uh, cash flows and that is called as the technical term here we call it as the negative incremental effect we have to take into account in our cash flow that is called as a negative incremental effect so when you take into account the negative incremental effect means we show that in the our cash flow statement like the loss of contribution of the existing products loss of the contribution from the existing products and if you show it it is treated like a cost it is treated like a cash outflow or the loss of the revenue so what will happen that if you treat it as a negative incremental effect the loss of the sales of the existing products because of the new product in that case what will happen the new product may when we evaluate the whole means, uh, means the whole cash flow available the new product may result into the negative cash flows or the lesser cash flows or it may not look, look like a profitable product so we can think about it that if there is a some negative effect is going to be there or cannibalization effect is going to be there then you have to evaluate it very carefully can we avoid the introduction of the new product because the net increase is not going to be too much we are going to add up uh, the fifth product but it is affecting the sales of the existing four products so it means because of the erosion of the sales of the existing products we are going to introduce it but the net result of the new product is going to be uh, negative or sometimes not very much positive so can we avoid it but then you have to consider the important consideration that okay we can avoid it but if our competitors introduce the product which we are now proposing to introduce then what will happen anyway we are going to lose the sales now we are going to lose the sales in favor of our own product right but in that case we will be losing the sales in favor of the product introduced by our competitors so in that situation what happens that it sometime becomes inevitable that is better for us to introduce the product and if we are going to lose the sales of existing products for example you talk about a firm is manufacturing different kind of refrigerators 
different kind of the refrigerators right. So, we have uh, say uh, the four refrigerators different kind of the refrigerators we are currently manufacturing and when you introduce the more advanced or more uh, say energy efficient or with the more features the fifth new refrigerator in the market. It may be possible that the sales of the either of the four uh, existing refrigerators may come down because people will shift from the existing of the products may be from the product 4 to the product 5 or the refrigerator number 4 to the refrigerator number 5 because the refrigerator number 5 is more advanced in the technology in the features and the price difference is not that much. But you have to be careful here if we avoid the introduction of that fifth refrigerator but it may be possible that our competitors introduce that product. So, sometime what will happen that our customers for the refrigerator number 4 will be shifting say towards our competitors because they have come out with the new product almost for the same price or little increase in the price, but with the more advanced features. So, in that case we have to look the whole thing in totality that if there is a complete entry barrier that the product is protected by the technology uh, say uh, patenting or maybe any kind of the trademarking or any kind of the business agreements if there are some strict entry barriers are there and there is means, uh, no uh, possibility there is no likelihood that our competitors will introduce a new product uh, which may become the competitive competitive product for the, uh, the firm in question then the firm in question can avoid the introduction of the product number 5 because it will lose the sales of the existing products. But if it is there is no entry barrier product is very simple so much of the competition is there in the market then in that case it is always better to introduce a new product and count upon the cash flows and ignore even the loss of the cash flows occurring because of the refrigerator number say less lesser sales of the refrigerator number 4 that can be ignored because anyway we are going to lose the sales because if we do not introduce a new product somebody else will do it then we will not lose the sales in favor of our means or within the firm, but somebody else will gain. So, it means in that case that negative incremental effect can be avoided and we can say that what is the now cash flow from the existing 4 products plus the incremental cash flow from the 5th product. So, means uh, that that can be taken like that. But if it is uh, say uh, there is no possibility that no competitor can come then either we have to count it as a negative incremental cash flow rather than counting it as a positive because positive you are counting from the product number 5. But the product number 4 sales loss should be counted as that is call, called as a loss of uh, say existing contribution. So, that should be say taken into account as a negative incremental effect and then the positive from the new product and then the net effect should be worked out. So, cannibalization effect working out the cannibalization effect is very very important consideration in say, uh, say uh, following the incremental principle. Then we talk about the next important requirement here is that is of the ignore sunk cost. So, if you talk about the sunk cost yes sunk cost should be ignored anyway because they do not make any sense to keep on say thinking about the sunk cost. Now, what is the sunk cost? when we want to introduce a new product in the market right. So, uh, sometimes huge preliminary expenses have to be incurred they may be on say conducting the market survey or may be say uh, trying to find out that what new product can be manufactured and at the same time say for the new product once we have identified the product and everything then how the product will be manufactured what will be the attributes what will be the input requirements. So, you have to incur huge R and D expenses huge R and D expenses. So, for incurring the huge R and D expenses means if you now you start counting upon that once we have now finally manufactured the product and the product is now about to go to the market or finally the product goes to the market. At that time if you start counting upon the cost right from the beginning day one when we started thinking about the product or the say introduction of the product. So, what will happen the cost of introducing the project uh, product will become very huge. Now, for example, if uh, say we want to identify a new drug the drug manufacturing companies or the pharmaceutical companies there is estimate in the market that if you want to come out with a with a with the new drug new drug it means it is not a process uh, new process manufacturing the drug with the new process, but the new product itself means identifying the new molecule 
if you want to identify the new molecule, we are existing, in the firm is existing pharmaceutical company, they are manufacturing different type of the drugs, different type of the medicines, but they want to introduce now the new uh, drug for curing one particular kind of the ailment. So, uh, there is one estimate that identification or identifying a new molecule, new drug in the market or for the market or for curing any kind of the different kind of the ailments. It requires minimum 10,000 crores of Indian rupees, 10,000 crores of investment and minimum 10 years period of time. So, it means if we want to come out with a new drug and we are going to invest where we are ready to invest 10,000 crores. So, larger part of that 10,000 crores should be considered as a sunk cost because if you tomorrow price the product like that our total investment is 10,000 crores and we have to recover now that the whole amount from the market plus the existing manufacturing expenses also, then what will happen? The price of the drug will be so exorbitant, so high that it may be beyond the reach of the people. So, what you have to do is that till the date of identification of that mod molecule, whatever the cost has been incurred, that cost should be considered as a sunk cost. And for calculating the present cash flows, we have to only we have to only take into account the present manufacturing cost, selling and distribution cost, after sales service cost, administrative cost, all these costs for giving shape to that product or that particular final product to be taken to the market, that cost should be taken into account and then the revenue available from that total product after selling that in the market. If you start recovering the entire 10,000 crore from that particular drug, then it may be very difficult that the cash flows of this or the net present value of that particular new product will never become positive. So, we have to misconsider initial cost, preliminary cost or R&D cost which we have incurred and sometime it may be very huge. So, that cost has to be considered as a sunk cost and we have to means focus upon the current cost which is a manufacturing and selling and distribution cost of the product and compare that with the revenue for evaluating the product to be taken to the market or not to be taken to the market or especially for say evaluating the cash flow of the uh, calculating the cash flow of the uh, say the, the, of, of the uh, from the new product right. Then third one important thing here is the include opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is something like that for example, uh, we have the uh, different resources available. So, while investing those resources for example, uh, now the firm is already there in the market, they are already manufacturing 4 products, they want to introduce the fifth new product in the market. Right. So, that fifth new product will take investment cost, first of all you have to shell out money, you have to invest that, that will be caused as a, uh, called as a cash outflow, after that the cash inflow will start coming in. So, we have to be careful that while thinking about investing that surplus funds available with us for coming out with a new product in the market, we should be means open mindedly think about if we invest this surplus amount available with us in this product, how much return is available? And if we invest it somewhere else or we uh, miss uh, say uh, dot uh, make use of these resources ourselves, we give it to somebody, maybe if we have the investment, we can uh, say may, uh, invest that in the market or we have the surplus capacity, we have the uh, surplus buildings, we can rent them out or we can sell them off. So, what is the opportunity cost of introducing the new product that also has to be taken into account because one resource or the set of resources have the multiple uses and you have to select that use which is the going to give you the best outcome, right? best cash flows. So, you have the number of options available. For example, uh, existing resources if they are in the form of the plant capacity or in the form of the say, uh, the say some buildings or maybe other physical facility that can be rented out. So, can be rent it out, can be sell it off or sometime it can be possible that if we manufacture product number 5 or if we can strengthen the sales of existing 4 products, either of the 2 choices are there. So, you have to now consider it in totality that out of the given possible alternatives, what is the best possible use and if I invest this surplus resources into the new product, how much cash flow is available and if I say use into the existing uh, products I am manufacturing and selling in the market, how much uh, say cash flow will be available. So, means a clear cut 
open minded uh, opportunity analysis, opportunity cost analysis has to be done and what is the best outcome we have to go for that. So, this is another part of the incremental principle which is very very important cost, uh, important consideration. And the next one is the uh, question the allocation of the overhead cost, right? question the allocation of the overhead cost. What are the overheads? As I told you, the, the overheads are those expenses which you can call it as the indirect expenses. Direct expenses are directly attributable. Right. If you manufacture the product, you are going to incur the raw material cost, you are going to incur the direct labor cost, you are going to incur the direct overheads cost. But sometime indirect overhead cost is there. So, you have to follow the principle here that if by introducing the new product, if there is going to be any increase in the fixed cost or the indirect cost, then only that increased part should be taken into account. Otherwise, if for example, from the existing indirect expenses or the fixed expenses, for example, the plant capacity is there. If you are going to add up a new plant, then certainly you should take into account the depreciation of that new plant. But for example, we have the surplus capacity in the existing plant and we are going to make use of that and by making use of that, we are going to introduce the fifth product. So, there is no point say adding up those additional say indirect overhead heads into the say or subtracting it from the cash inflows or calling it as a cash outflow. So, that depends upon that if there is going to be additional overheads allocate them to the new product cash flows or subtract them from the new products cash inflows. But if there is no change is going to be there then for the moment you can ignore it also because it is immaterial for us whether you introduce the product you do not introduce the product you are going to incur the same amount of the fixed cost or the indirect cost. So, it means in that case means why to uh, say consider it uh, at as a cash outflow because cash outflow is not taking place. And the one uh, Im last important thing uh, we are going to talk about here is that is the estimate working capital properly. It is a Sometime what we do is we consider it a very you know, say major mistake while working out the cash flows and we uh, say sometimes commit a mistake and that mistake is called as say uh, not estimating the working capital requirements properly or wrongly or wrongfully estimating the working capital requirements. Because we should be clear when you are adding up the fixed capacity or you are going to introduce a new product right it requires the cash outflow on the two important accounts. One is on the fixed expenses, another is upon the short term expenses which is called as the working capital. Right. So, if you talk about the working capital part, in the working capital part you have to be very careful that when you talk about say thinking about or working out the working capital, we have to uh, think in terms of because working capital is estimated in terms of say uh, uh, you can call it as uh, what is the uh, say uh, total investment requirement in the fixed asset as a percentage of the fixed assets we can work out the working capital requirements or sometimes as a percentage of the sales coming out of the new product we can work out the working capital requirements or if we do not want to follow these two approaches then there is the operating cycle approach. So, that operating cycle means investing cash to meet the working capital requirements and then converting it again back into cash. So, it means you need the working capital for buying of raw material for paying of the wages, salaries, then electricity expenses, water expenses because your plant machinery and building the capacity which you have created for manufacturing the new product or adding the new product will be useful only if we have the raw material to use those machines, if we have the people to work on those machines, if we have the power to use those machines, if we have the proper water requirement fulfill for required uh, requirement to fulfill the requirement of the existing manufacturing facility. So, for all those things are there then only the fixed cost is going to be of any sense or going to make any sense otherwise it is not going to make any sense. So, what happens many a times we are very serious or very seriously we work out the fixed uh, capital requirement, but we sometimes oversight or miscalculate the working capital requirements. So, we have to very carefully work out the working capital requirement and in that case we have to go for the net working capital requirement. For working it out we have to calculate the net working capital requirement. What is the net working capital requirement? That is the current assets minus current liabilities. Right. So, what is the current assets required? Current assets are required in terms of inventory, in terms of supporting the credit sales, in terms of keeping the cash in hand and cash at bank. So, this is totally is called as the current assets. 
and then to fulfill this requirement of current assets parts of the funds will be available in the form of the current liabilities. Current liabilities means suppliers credit is there or maybe the say your uh, say wages we have not to worry for at least 30 days or this power expenses or the water expenses we have not to worry for the 30 days. So, this virtual credit is available to us. So, it means what is the total current assets requirement? in the firm after introducing the new product and what how much funds will be available from the current liabilities and the difference will be called as the networking capital. So, that networking capital has to be worked out very carefully, we should not commit any kind of mistakes. One important uh, another important thing here is that in case of the fixed assets whatever the investment we make in the fixed assets that keeps on depreciating over a period of time. For example, the life of the project is say uh, 5 years right from the 0 year, 0 year is a current year and then the next 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 years are there the cash inflows are expected. So, in those 5 years for example, we are going to use that plant machinery buildings for the 5 years all the fixed assets for the 5 years and the depreciation on the plant and machinery is going to be say 20 percent right. So, it means that value of plant and machinery is going to say be 0 uh, at the end of the 5th year. But still for example, whatever that skeleton or maybe the that that um, is, uh, structure is left out that can be sold in the market. So, we can say though the technical value will become 0, but said that structure of the plant and machinery will fetch some value. So, that is called as a salvage value. So, while uh, say calculating the say uh, terminal cash flows, we calculate the salvage value of the fixed assets plant machinery or sometimes the buildings also. But in case of the working capital, working capital is recoverable in the full amount, working capital does not decrease right, it remains the same amount because that investment which we are making for example, it is 20 percent of sales right. So, 20 percent of sales you are investing where in the inventory, in the credit sales, in the cash maybe in the cash in hand and cash at bank. So, you are investing there right. So, at the point of or at the time of termination of the project you can recover that full amount. So, it is not to be treated like fixed assets where only salvage value will be available as a terminal value, but in case of the working capital full amount will be recovered. So, when you convert the current assets into cash then the full whole, whole amount full amount has to be taken into consideration as the terminal value of the working capital unlike the terminal value of the fixed assets. So, be careful that while calculating the working capital requirement always look for the net working capital requirement that will be required to be invested in cash. Second thing is while calculating the terminal value you have to assume here that the full terminal value at the time of the termination of the project full working capital will be recoverable and that cash inflow has to be counted or considered at the time of the fifth year or at the year of the termination of the project. So, there is a basic difference major difference in the say terminal value of the fixed assets and the terminal value of the working capital or the current assets. So, these are some important considerations to be borne in mind while talking about the incremental principle which is a very very important principle and we should be carefully means uh, considering all these points while working out the cash flows. After that uh, two more principles are also there post tax principle and then the consistency principle these two principles are equally important very relevant very important while estimating the cash flows, but these two principles remaining two principles I will discuss with you in the next class till then thank you very much.